Hello, friends, and welcome to this week's online service. It is wonderful, isn't it, that we have the technology available, that we can continue um, to connect, even though this is in a different way. And I do wish we were gathering in person, because it does feel weird to be looking at a camera and not all your lovely faces. Um, we do pray that this service this morning is an encouragement to you as um, you gather at home. Um, also, a very happy Father's Day to all the dads and the father figures in our lives. And it is a good day to stop and to remember and celebrate our perfect Heavenly Father too. Um, in our service today, we will be finishing our series in Acts and John Cooper will be speaking to us from Acts 28. Um, but let's start our service this morning in prayer. Um, I'm going to pray generally and then I will continue on by saying the Lord's Prayer. Um, if you know it or have it in front of you, um, please feel free to join with me. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that we can gather around your word this morning. We thank you that your word is reliable and true. And I pray that as we read your word, you would give us understanding and enable us to respond to you rightly. That we wouldn't just hear your word, but you might help us to live it out. May we be people that glorify you in our daily lives. We ask this all for your glory. Amen. And as our Saviour has taught us, we are confident to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to spend some time reading God's word together. And Marcus, John, and Chris have kindly come to help us with this today. So you might like to pause your video here and grab your Bible if you don't already have it with you. Um, and our first reading is in Acts 28. Thank you, Marcus. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, great to be at church for me. Um, it's good to see all you guys. My name is Marcus O'Sullivan, and I go to the 9.30 service. And I'm going to be reading from Acts 28, uh, the first 16 verses, which follows on from Paul uh, on his way to Rome, just being shipwrecked. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta, the islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up and suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways. And when we were, when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had been wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up and on the following day, we reached Petioli. 
There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming and they travelled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, my name is John Hanson and I uh, attend the 9.30 service. And our second reading continues on in Acts 28 from verse 17. Three days later, Paul called together the local leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, yet I was arrested in in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. When they had examined me, the Romans wanted to release me because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to the emperor, even though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and to speak to you, since it is for the sake of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, We have received no letter from Judea about you, And none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken anything evil about you. But we would like to hear from you what you think. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. After they had set a day to meet with him, they came to him at his lodgings in great numbers. From morning until evening, he explained the matter to them testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he had said, while others refused to believe. So they disagreed with each other, and as they were leaving, Paul made one further statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your ancestors through the prophet Isaiah, Go to this people and say, You will indeed listen, but never understand. You will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their eyes, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes, so they might not look with their eyes, And listen with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Let it be known to you then that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense, and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My name's Chris and I go to just about all the services, I think. Uh, I'm going to read from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, and this particular reading will take us to the heart of this book that we've been working our way through. Uh, So Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. So when they had come together, they asked him, that's Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
This is the word of the Lord. Hello, my name's John. I'm one of the pastors here. We're in lockdown at the moment and maybe you've been watching a little bit more Netflix than you normally do. Um, Let me ask you the question, have you ever seen a TV series that's had an unsatisfactory ending? Week after week you keep coming back, the, the drama grips you and you want to find out what will happen. There's all these questions that hang in the air. So when it comes to the the final episode, you sit down with your family and you're hoping that it's all going to come together. But before anything gets resolved, the screen goes black and the credits roll. Instead of tying up the loose ends, it only leaves you with more questions. Well, I've got to admit, the first time that I read Acts and and got to the very last chapter, and in subsequent times, uh, that's the kind of feeling that I've had, like that unsatisfactory ending. For seven chapters, Luke has been ratcheting up the tension. Paul must go to Rome. Paul must appear before Caesar. This is his only chance of freedom. This is the only way that justice can be done. And then it slows right down as he gets on a ship and makes his way to Rome. Uh, There's a storm, they get lost at sea, there's a shipwreck. They get washed up on an island, there's a snake bite, and and the narrative, it slows right down, and it creates this feeling that whatever is going to happen in Rome, this must be one epic showdown. But when we get to the final scene, where is the showdown between Paul and Caesar? Where is the much-anticipated trial? What's going to happen? Has he been found guilty and executed, or is he set free? And after building and building and building the drama, Luke just leaves us hanging. Well, over the years, people have come up with different thoughts on why Acts ends the way it does. Some say that that Luke, having written a couple of books now, is planning his his third. You've got Luke, you've got Acts, and then you've got another one coming out on the top of this cliffhanger about the trial in Rome. Other people think maybe... Uh, Luke was planning to write chapter 29, but something happened. Or or maybe the end fell off the scroll and, and there is Acts 29 out there somewhere, but no one knows where it is. I think there's actually a better explanation. And it begins with recognizing that Acts is not about the apostles. They definitely feature big and large, but they're not the main star. It's not about Peter. It's not about Paul. It's about the progress of the gospel. It's what we see in those verses that Chris read to us that the Lord Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. As the gospel moves out across these geographical boundaries, a key moment for the progress of the gospel will be when it makes it to Rome. And that's what we actually come to in chapter 28. Uh, Luke kind of describes it in a a very underwhelming way in verse 14. And it might seem underwhelming, but it's a big moment for the progress of the gospel. Uh, If you've got your Bible there, just peer down at verse 14. Uh, This is the way that Luke puts it. And so we came to Rome. This is a big moment for the progress of the gospel. Rome was the largest city in the world at that time. It had a population of over a million people and it would be some 700 years before any city in the world would would reach anywhere near that kind of population. Rome dominated the world for hundreds of years. And it seems that the strategy that God is, is going to use is he's going to use Rome as a vehicle that will carry the gospel into the rest of the world. Just as we say all roads lead to Rome, well, those same roads can be used to take the gospel out from it. And so we came to Rome. It's a big moment for the progress of the gospel. 
Well, as we watch Paul make his way up the coast, there's a couple of little stops uh, along the way. Paul bumps into some believers. Pick the story up with me at verse 13. After one day there, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we came to Putoli. There we found believers who were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. The believers from there, when they heard of us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. It's kind of ironic. So much of the last seven chapters has been about the gospel getting to Rome and and when Paul gets to Rome, well, the gospel's already beaten him there. It's not particularly surprising to Paul. He's already written a letter to the church in Rome. He knows that there are believers there. And if we've been following Acts closely, it shouldn't surprise us either. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached at Pentecost, there were citizens of Rome who heard the gospel message who no doubt responded to the gospel message and they've taken it back with them. And these believers, that they make their way down to Paul and boy did he need a visit from them. Uh, verse 15, on seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. Uh, the last few years, that they've had a heavy toll on the Apostle Paul. It's been tough, trial after trial. The Jews crying out for his blood, shipwrecked, washed up on an island, defending himself again and again because he knows that his life hangs in the balance. You might say that he's been stretched to breaking point and then he's been stretched again and again. And as these believers, they they go to the trouble of making their way down to Paul, well, immediately he thanks God and, and he draws strength from them. They give him courage as he goes on about the work of the gospel. There's something here for us, isn't there? Uh, We know only too well that the Christian life can be a difficult one, that at times there can be harrowing experiences. It's something that the book of Acts actually tells us about. Chapter 14, verse 22. It's through many troubles we enter the kingdom of God. And those who lead us in the gospel, well, they, like the Apostle Paul, face their own unique pressures, unique challenges, complexities and difficulties. So maybe there's something here that we can learn from the example of the Roman Christians. Maybe they can teach us to not leave one another stranded, isolated. Maybe they can teach us to be people that reach out to one another and to reach out to those who are leading us when they're under pressure, This might actually be something that helps us at a time like this, to be people that are thoughtful and thinking about how we might be an encouragement. Well, when Paul finally makes it to Rome, he's placed under house arrest straight away, and we're expecting that this is the moment that Luke has been building us up for, the epic showdown between Paul and Caesar. But that's not what he records. Verse 17... Three days later, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, yet I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. When they had examined me, the Romans wanted to release me because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But when the Jews objected... I was compelled to appeal to the emperor, even though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is for the sake of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. Paul's saying, you can clearly see that I'm a a criminal, I'm in chains, but I'm not here because I've done anything wrong. I'm here because I believe that Jesus is the hope of Israel, that his resurrection demonstrates that he is the Messiah that we've been waiting for, the only one who can forgive our sins. And they reply in verse 21, We have received no letters from Judea about you, 
And none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we would like to hear from you what you think. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is being spoken against. Well, so far, Paul's accusers haven't fronted up. Could it be that he's out of sight and out of mind? Or could it be that a letter has been written, but it got lost in the post? Uh, Maybe the letter was in the ship, and when the ship went down, well, the letter never made it to Rome. Who knows? In verse 23, we're told that the next day they turn up to meet with the Apostle Paul, and he holds up uh, the law of Moses and the prophets, and he draws a line between that and the Lord Jesus, and he says, uh, see, you can see how what the Old Testament says about the kingdom of God finds its fulfillment in the person of Jesus. Uh, Surely his resurrection proves that he is the king that we've been waiting for. Uh, Surely you can see here in the Old Testament that Jesus is the only one who can atone with sin. Uh, Surely you can see here that Jesus is the only one who can reverse the effects of the fall and deal with the way that we've been alienated from God. And it says that as some people sat there and they listened, they were persuaded but there were others who wouldn't believe. So they start fight, fighting and squabbling among themselves and, and as they're arguing about who's right and who's wrong, Paul sticks up his hand, he interrupts them and he says, look, I can help you here. I can give you a theological explanation for why you feel the way that you feel right now. And he reads to them uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 6, verse 26. You will indeed listen, but never understand, and you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes, so that they might not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. And then Paul turns to them and he says, this is talking about you. You've blocked your ears to what the scriptures are saying. You've shut your eyes so that you cannot see that Jesus is the hope of Israel. This is talking about you. But what's the application? Well, Paul doesn't leave us hanging. He gets to it straight away in verse 28. Let it be known to you then that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles they will listen. When Jesus said at the very beginning of Acts that the gospel would go from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, he wasn't merely talking about the gospel crossing geographical boundaries. He was saying that the gospel would cross a theological line too, that the saving work of God would no longer be reserved just for the people of Israel but that it would be sent into the world to the Gentiles too. And that's the very point that Paul is making here in their company, that God's salvation, it's not just for you anymore, but it will go to the Gentiles and they will listen. Uh, If you like, it's a little bit like a dam spilling over. God's grace has broken the banks of Israel's borders and it's spilling over into the other nations You guys won't listen, you want to walk away, but the Gentiles will. And here we have a promise right from the heart of God, that Christianity will be global. And it's this verse here, verse 28, that ought to fill us with much optimism about what God is doing in the world. We can be too pessimistic at times. We can look at the declining influence of Christianity in our society We can see the way progressive agendas seem to be picking up speed. And we can put two and two together and think, well, the future of the Christian faith doesn't look very bright, does it? But it just doesn't fit with what God promises here. If God will send his salvation across the world, promising that when the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, they will listen, then we really need to be more optimistic History backs this up. 
Over the last 2,000 years, Christianity has been backed into some pretty precarious situations. But stop and think for a minute about what has happened across the passage of time. In every generation, no matter what situation the Christian church has found itself in, every generation since the apostles, Jesus has drawn people to himself. We need to be far more optimistic. Uh, Verse 28, it really ought to be one of those verses that, that we write down and stick on the fridge or hang on the wall One of those verses that we turn to when we're feeling negative. When those doubts start to creep in about what God is doing. One of those verses that fires us up when our evangelistic zeal is waning. Let it be known to you then that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. It ought to give us much optimism about missionary work. It ought to fire up our our willingness to go and our prayer for those who've gone. It's so tempting for us to think that when we send people to the other side of the world, to people who've barely heard about Jesus, who are not so interested in Jesus, for us to kind of think, well, I'm glad that they're willing to go, but what sort of impact can we really expect them to have? But look at verse 28 again. It calls that thinking out for what it really is. It's just plain wrong. It's a lie straight from the mouth of the devil. If God has promised when the gospel is preached, they will listen. Then we shouldn't be surprised to hear back from our link missionaries that people are being saved. We shouldn't be surprised when we send out the Langmeads or the the Timoroskis that the gospel begins to get traction in their communities. We shouldn't be surprised when the gospel turns up in our workplace that people start to surrender to Jesus. We shouldn't be surprised when we speak about the Lord Jesus in our homes that he starts to change us. We shouldn't be surprised that when we go out into the community and we ask people about Jesus and we speak about his great love for them that some of them will receive him as their Lord and Saviour. That's what God has promised. They will listen. So what do you think of Luke's ending? Do you still find it unsatisfactory? Well, if you think the book of Acts is a story about Paul and his journey towards freedom, then you would. But it's not about Peter. It's not about Paul, but it's about the progress of the gospel. It's a very fitting ending. The gospel has broken the borders of Israel and gone into the world. The gospel that's not just for the Jew, but for the Gentile too. The gospel that cannot be stopped. And we get a little glimpse of that at the the very end of the book in, in the final two verses. Verse 30 says, He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. What happened after two years? Did the accusers finally turn up? Did he face Caesar? Was he executed or set free? We don't know. But two years, that's a good amount of time to make an impact for the gospel. Paul's been in other places a year and a half, two years, and two years, it's, it's a long time for the Apostle Paul. Day in, day out, people can come to him, he'll, he'll teach them about the Lord Jesus He will disciple them, he will equip them, and he will send them out to continue to spread the gospel. So it it concludes by saying that boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we think, how can that be? Boldly and without hindrance? He's under house arrest. There's a a guard there 24 7, he's in chains. But while Paul is in chains, the gospel is not. Paul cannot leave, but the gospel can. The gospel can go out from him across the highways and the byways of the Roman Empire and across space and time to you and me and from you and me on and on and on into the world. Perhaps the way to think about Luke's ending is not to think about it as an ending, 
but to see it rather as a promise. A promise that the work of the gospel will never end. So long as people are outside the love of Christ, there's nothing that will stop God from sending out his saving word. So there you have it. That's the book of Acts. Luke, he doesn't answer all of our questions, but there is one question remaining that only you can answer. What part will you play in the progress of the gospel? Let me lead us in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, please help us to take these things to heart. Please help us to respond in repentance and faith. Please help our response to bring honour and glory to the Lord Jesus. And we thank you and give you praise that you have such a heart for lost people, that you've sent your gospel all across the world and even to us. Please help us to pass it on. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello everyone. My name's Sharon and uh, like Chris, I go to many of the services. We're going to continue on in prayer now, thinking about what John has uh, just shared with us from Acts and uh, his prayer at the end as well. I'm going to pray three prayers and at the end of each of those prayers, I'm going to use the phrase that you might be familiar with. So please join me if you know it. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, as we come to the end of our journey through Acts, we want to thank you for all we've learned and been encouraged by in this book. Thank you that we've been reminded of the God who wants all people to hear the message of the gospel and who offers salvation to everyone from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We can only approach you now because your saving gospel has been proclaimed down through the ages and across the world and has come to us here in this place. Thank you that at the end of Acts we see Paul under house arrest yet still sharing the gospel boldly and without hindrance. What a wonderful reminder that this gospel is unstoppable because you are at work to take your gospel message to the ends of the earth. As we continue to live in lockdown with restrictions and frustrations, help us to remember that you are the God who is unstoppable. Chains, pandemics, lockdowns cannot stop your work in us, through us and in others. Help us to play our part, even under difficult circumstances, to live out your gospel message in word and deed, with boldness and without hindrance. May we be intentional about taking every opportunity to demonstrate and share the faith, love and hope we have in Jesus, so that we may be an encouragement and a witness to those around us, both believers and unbelievers. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord God, we also pray for the spread of the gospel across our diocese. We thank you for those who are serving you in parishes in the western regions, and we pray in particular for Kurt and Beck Langmead at Lightning Ridge, Steve and Lou Chimorosti at Warrialda, and George and Carmel Ferguson at Walgett. Thank you for their willingness to serve you in these smaller, isolated places of our diocese. As COVID spreads to their towns or areas near them, we do pray that you might protect them and their families, grant them peace as they put their trust in you, and enable them to share the gospel and encourage the saints with boldness and without hindrance. We also pray for our parish through this time. Grant us peace, unity and mutual love and enable us to be a beacon of light and hope in our community. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Heavenly Father, nothing is hidden from your eyes. We see just a fraction of the suffering in this world, but you see it all. You are intimately acquainted with the pain and suffering of those in Afghanistan who face an uncertain future under Taliban leadership. Those in countries where COVID is out of control and causing great devastation and loss of life. Those living in poverty, those who face persecution and oppression. As you take your gospel to the ends of the earth, may these people have opportunity to hear the saving message of Jesus so that they can have hope beyond the struggles of this life and they can know your presence and comfort through whatever they are facing at this time. We pray too for those we know and love who are finding life difficult right now, those who are facing physical illness or even terminal illness, those who are battling with mental health issues, those who are finding the current restrictions really hard to deal with. Through times of distress, may we and those we know and love find you to be the source of all comfort and hope. Help us all to know you as the everlasting well of all good things that never runs dry, the God who satisfies our deepest needs, our Father in heaven, who offers us your strength in our weakness. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, friends, that brings us to the end of our service today. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I know I've been encouraged as we've gone through the book of Acts in seeing that Luke didn't write this book simply as a, to record history, but to encourage the church in every age to be faithful to the Lord and to carry the gospel to the end of the earth. Um, Charles Spurgeon so helpfully said, since we are assured that the same Lord is mighty still to carry on his heavenly designs, for he said, lo, I am with you always. And that is a wonderful encouragement. We do pray that you've been encouraged too. Um, and in finishing our series in Acts, we will be now um, starting in the book of Hebrews, which is going to be a wonderful follow-on from the time that we spent in Leviticus. Um, if you want to see the readings that are coming up, you can find them in our term program, uh, which is on our website. Or if you'd like a hard copy, please do let us know. Um, we do hope to be meeting together again soon. Um, but while we remain in lockdown, please let us know if you need anything at all. Um, we would love to be supporting you and praying with you. Um, let me now finish our service in prayer. Gracious Lord, we do thank you for your word. Help us as your people to be faithful in the way that we live for you and proclaim you in our daily lives. We are grateful that you are with us always. May we trust you and rely on you in every circumstance that we are faced with. Amen. Have a wonderful day, friends.